Hi, I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I am your host, Adrian Schneer, and I am so glad and grateful that you have taken time out of your busy day to spend some year with me. Today, we're going to be talking about something that I've received actually a lot of questions about, and that is when school starts again, it's currently the fall, we're just starting the fall semester here in Canada, And the question that I receive often is, how do we balance application writing with our schoolwork and our jobs and our family commitments and responsibilities? And so I wanted to talk about that today because our clients, our community members have medical school applications coming up, their deadlines are coming up, law school deadlines are coming up in October and November. And then In December, January, February, we have grad school applications coming up, those deadlines. So we actually spoke about this in our group coaching call for Mastering Academic Applications the other day, and we had a really great conversation. So I wanted to provide much of that conversation and the strategies that we talked about there. I wanted to provide that here for you. So the first thing I want to do is sort of unpack how we think about our classes, how we think about school. If you've been around a while, if you've been part of the community for a while, and if you've been following us on Instagram at Apply Yourself Global, if you've been engaging with us, if you're currently one of our community members, then you know that I've been a professor for over 10 years. I've been teaching at a Toronto University for over 10 years. I've been on admissions committees at the graduate and professional school levels, and I run a law firm and I run Apply Yourself, the advancement spot. And one of the things that I think is so important that I've realized over the years and that was again apparent to me today when I taught my first class of the fall semester is that students, you know, filter into the classroom, we all sit down and it's like, oh, another course, you know, I'm just, I just got to get this degree or I've just got to get this certification. And one of the things that we talked about in class today was that it's not actually about this one class or one assignment or one exam. It's actually about the choices that we make every single day that get us one step closer or one step further, one step closer to or one step further from that life that we want to build, create and build for ourselves. And so something that we talked about today was that it's, and something that we talk about in our community all the time is that when we are taking our classes, when we're taking, writing our assignments, writing our exams, studying, learning the material, it's it's about the skills that you're developing, not just in terms of research and writing, but also in terms of the habits that we're developing, the discipline that we're developing that allows us to actually excel. And that's really important. A lot of the time we view discipline as something that is a prison that is something that is binding us to something that we just don't want to do or it's such a drag to do. But I think that if we rewind and we really just take a step back and look at what our choices are, why are we in this class? Why are we learning this information? Then it makes it a lot more enjoyable and palatable to be there. Certainly the way that I have always looked at my education, my when I was doing my undergrad, my master's, my PhD, and my law degree, I always had this, and trust me, it wasn't always easy, and we've talked about that in the podcast before, but one of the things that I always focused on was what habits am I developing now that are going to help me be somebody who can serve in the way that I want to. So for me, that meant developing discipline in classes that I enjoyed and in classes that I didn't. And again, if you've been here for a while, you know that I'm very honest about my experience. And so I'm, you know, we all have classes that we really like and we all have classes that we despise. And it's the same 
for me, I'm no different. I've had classes that I've really enjoyed and I've had classes that were, you know, a real chore to attend. But what kept me going is actually having this perspective of the classes that was productive, not destructive. And that meant that I was looking at the classes in such a way that they were helping me build a skill set, that they were helping me build skills that I that I was trying to refine and and develop from scratch at the time, but which have served me tenfold, a hundredfold at this point. The discipline, the work ethic, doing things you don't want to do. I mean, it's part of life to do things you don't want to do. Sometimes to work with people who who you rather not work with. Luckily now I've built both my companies in such a way that we only work with the the you know the people that we want to our dream clients. And that is purposeful. That is purposeful because simply, you know, if we aren't, you know, meeting, you know, if our minds aren't meeting at the same level, or if, you know, you don't want to be here working with us, then you're not going to attend. You're not going to put in the effort. And that's something that is really important that whatever you are working on, whatever does mean something to you, you actually put in the effort. And that is a choice that you make. It's a choice that you make every day. Do you want to make decisions and put the effort in the time in, the energy in, to something that means something to you, to build that life that you want, one small choice at a time, sometimes big choices, but mostly small choices every single day? Or are you going to make choices that don't get you one step closer? In fact, they may get you one step further. And this includes things like who you hang out with, who are you spending time with, Are you spending time with people who support you or are you spending time with people who you don't feel supported by, who don't support your ambitions, who pressure you perhaps into doing other things that maybe aren't in alignment with what it is that you want to do? So these are all really important questions to ask yourself. How do you want to spend your time? How do you want to spend your energy? And what choices are you making to take you one step closer to building that life that you want? Are you putting off applying to your graduate or professional school programs? Are you putting off taking that last class that you have to take? Are you putting off applying for jobs? Are you putting, whatever it is, if you're putting it off, it's not taking you any closer to that life that you are creating, that life beyond your wildest dreams that you absolutely can have. But it takes discipline, motivation, And an understanding, a very clear understanding that every single choice you make down to who you hang out with, how you spend your time, what your habits are every single day, contribute to that dream life or don't. And if something is not contributing, it's taking you further away. So number one is to really reframe how we perceive our coursework, our time in school, or our time working in a certain job or the several jobs or engaging in commitments that we have with our families and others. So this is really important to reconsider. Again, it's not just about the class and it's not just about the exam or the assignment. It's about developing the skills that you are going to need when you when you graduate, when you convocate, and as you continue on your path beyond your degree or your certification or whatever it is that you're currently enrolled in. So that's number one. We need to perceive what we're doing a little bit differently, more productively for us. And it's all about mindset. You know that here we focus on mindset, mindset, mindset here, because mindset is a huge determining factor of our success. So that's number one. Number two is that if you're working on applications, which everybody in our community is at one point or another, you are, whether they are for graduate or professional schools or whether they are for professional jobs, if you're starting your career, then also we have to reconceptualize is is the process of application development. And you might not agree, but applications don't have to be a drag. They don't have to be horrible. We don't have to suffer through them. In fact, here at Apply Yourself, we do not suffer through them. We actually really enjoy the process. And specifically, if you work with us in Mastering Academic Applications from Scratch to Submission, our 12-week course, you really get 
a lot more out of it than just finishing your application because you create your resume, you create your CV and I give you templates for everything and I work with you every single week to get those done. We work on your mindset. We work on your foundations. We work on organizing your technology. We work on your personal statements, your statements of intent, your research statements, your autobiographical sketches, what references, whatever it is that you and your application require. We work with with you either in our group coaching sessions or in our one-to-one if you become one of our VIP clients. And then once you graduate from Mastering Academic Applications, you have the opportunity to join our Success Society, which is our higher level coaching group. So applications don't have to be a drag because you can become part of, and and maybe if you're listening, you already are part of our wonderful community where we support each other and encourage each other. And you're coached by me specifically in creating your applications every single step of the way, all of your questions will be answered. And so those questions that are nagging at you for weeks and weeks and weeks, we will literally answer in like one minute. (laughs) <laughs> Many of my answers are longer than one minute, but you'll have your answer and you can just move on. And the application writing process actually becomes really, really enjoyable because the stress of the unknown disappears. The stress of the unknown disappears because of my experience and the way that we talk through and strategize through any barriers or any questions that you're that you have. So applications do not need to be a struggle. In fact, they are really enjoyable once you are, once you feel supported and once you have your questions answered. Applications are not this like big secretive thing. I think that what is part of the sort of public narrative or discourse around applications is that they're all so secretive. The truth is that they're not. The truth is that I've reviewed thousands of applications as an admissions committee member and as a job search committee member in the private sector. And there are very common things, characteristics of applications that very clearly can predict your chances of acceptance, whether it's for a job or a graduate or professional school. And it's not all about the score. I think that that's probably going to be something that you haven't heard many people say, but it is important that you know that because uh, as, as a member of admissions committee, I can tell you of admissions committees, I can tell you that there are people who don't have the highest scores, but they have amazing statements and they are able to, and this is what we do here at Apply Yourself, we craft really fantastic and aligned applications with you and your experience and what you want to do, what you want for your life. And that may sound complicated and it may sound as though, you know, you don't know what that next step can look like for you, but don't worry. That's why I'm here. That's why we're here and we figured this all out for you using my ton of experience. So I think that, you know, it's really important that we remember that applications do not have to be a struggle. And in fact, they can be really, really wonderful, reflective times for us that we can use to our benefit. And that is what we do here. And that is the feedback that we've had from our community members as well. And I am so proud of them and what they're doing these days, which is their programs. They're at McMaster, they're at Columbia, they're at NYU, they're at U of T, they're at Queens, they're at Western. They are everywhere and and we're so proud of them. And you could be too. That could be your next move. Okay, so the next way, the third way that I think is really important to stay on top of everything, your schoolwork, your jobs, your family commitments, and your applications, which I know are important to you because I know that your advancement is important to you, is to do a few things when the semester begins. Number one, is contact your professors. I, as a professor, always encourage my students, this is right at the top of our e-class page, or you might have Moodle or Blackboard or whatever your system is. I always encourage students right at the outset to email me and just introduce themselves. Just introduce themselves, tell me what's going on with you. And I also leave space for anything confidential that they want to tell me. And the number of responses that I get is more than a handful. I will tell you that students really take advantage of this opportunity to, to 
tell me a bit about themselves. And I appreciate that because sometimes it's not that they're asking for anything. And if they are, then that's fine for me, for other professors. I mean, I can't speak for everybody. I have heard from students that, you know, some professors are open to this, others are not in terms of getting to know their students and sort of, you know, providing alternatives, you know, options if something isn't working. But I always encourage my students to get in touch with me. And I always have a very high response rate, which is absolutely wonderful. So if your professors don't respond, that's okay. I always respond, but I think that it's really important that, you know, you just try to reach out and at least if they see your name in in their inbox, then if they're reading the attendance list or giving you participation marks or in class, if you put up your hand, then they'll remember your name. And I think that that's important, even if they don't say anything. If you're in person, if you're going to classes in person versus online, then you might want to walk up and introduce yourself after class. I know that I'm always more than happy to speak with students if they want to. And but I've also heard that, you know, that others have had have not had that experience. So I think it varies. But regardless, I think that you should try. Just try to reach out. The worst that can happen is that they don't respond. And then if something does happen during the semester, at least they know who you are. And at least maybe in that initial email, you've given them a bit of a heads up as to your situation. And so maybe they are, you know, more apprised of the situation, meaning that they are more in a better position to help to accommodate if you need accommodations. It's always a good thing for your professors to know you, to know who you are, to know your name. So make contact. If they don't respond, don't take it personally. That's okay. You can follow up later on in the semester as well. So the fourth thing is to, and I know that you're probably, you've heard this one before, but I'm going to talk about it in a way that I think that we haven't heard anyone speak about this, is staying on top of your coursework and on top of your readings. So I'm I'm not going to start on this whole like diatribe of like stay on top of your readings week to week and, you know, because sometimes or, you know, read your readings before class or whatever, because the truth is that you have to find a way that works for you. And I'll be honest, and I I think I've talked about this in the past on the podcast, but that if reading before class doesn't work for you, then read after class, right? If preparing for class and reading ahead of time doesn't actually help you, then read after class. And what I have found in some of my undergrad classes, but also in law school, was that In different classes, I did different things. You don't have to do the same thing using the same strategies for every single class if that's not working for you. So what I did sometimes was read before class and other times I read after class. And usually the deciding factor for that was how the professor taught. And so if the professor, you know, taught in a way where they really only focused on a few things in their readings, and I, you know, got to know that after the first few weeks, then I may decide to read after class because then I could more effectively focus. And it wasn't this, like, I wasn't reading, you know, a whole ton of pages without any context. But in some classes, I needed that context for the class. So I think you have to figure out what works for you. I don't think there's a one size fits all solution. There certainly wasn't for me and I'm one person. So if you're in classes and for some classes you read before and for some classes you read after, I think that's fine as long as it's working for you. So part of this conversation is also that you have to try different strategies to see what's working for you and what's not. And if something's not working for you, then don't be afraid to change it. Hey, don't be afraid to change it. And here at Apply Yourself, we help students all the time with strategizing in terms of what what works for them for classes and what doesn't and what may work better. Even if something is working, how can we make it work better for you? So that's also really important. And in figuring out what is working for you and what's not, You don't have to focus on what other people are doing. In fact, I don't think that we should be focusing on what other people are doing because what someone else is doing doesn't mean, you know, if it's working for them, doesn't mean it's going to work for us. And so I think that it's really important not to not to compare ourselves to others. And I know that that is a really a a really tough thing, you know, easier said than done. But we cannot compare ourselves to others. And as you know, if you've been part of our community and if you're new to the community, then welcome, of course. Then I'll take the opportunity to just talk a little bit about how we are a non-competition based community and we have a zero tolerance policy for competitive natured behavior. And what that means is that we work 
from a place of encouragement and support, not from a place of playing people off of other people or focusing on the numbers. We all know that the numbers are there. We all know the, you know, the competition is there and the stats are there. And we use that to inform perhaps our strategies for studying or our approaches, but we don't focus on that. And the reason that we don't focus on that is because it doesn't actually help us. It doesn't help us to focus on other people. What helps is to focus on ourselves and what we need to do to actually be successful. And that takes a lot of looking inward. It takes a lot of mindset work and it takes a lot of reflective work and being open to the process of really getting to know yourself at a level that you may not. And when you get to know yourself at that level, you begin to actually have a lot more confidence in yourself. And we help our clients with this all the time. And our clients' mindsets completely change. The transformations that we see are unbelievable. It is so important that we remember that we will not achieve the advancement that we want by focusing on other people. And even if you're moving ahead in your academics or your career by focusing on other people, it's coming at a cost to you. And I've seen this happen in real time. It comes at a cost to you. You may be excelling, but at what cost? At what cost to you, your mindset, your health, your well-being, your sleep, your habits? And really, we want to be very, very careful that we are absolutely focusing on you and not on other people. So here we take a zero tolerance policy for competitive natured behavior. And for more on why we take that perspective, you can head over and listen to episode two, where I talk about my experience with with what was extremely competitive and extremely intensely competitive set of situations that actually ended up developing and dictating and being the foundation for my journey to building Apply Yourself. So you can check out episode two for that. All right. So we've talked about doing things your way, not focusing on what other people are doing. The next piece I think that's really important is to talk about procrastination. So I know that it is really common for, you know, we might hear like, oh, you're procrastinating. Don't procrastinate. But the thing is, is I don't think it's completely fair to just you know, receive that advice from somebody, like don't do it because that's not helping the root cause of the situation. And the root cause of procrastination is often anxiety about the future, perhaps anxiety about the unknown, anxiety about not knowing how something's going to turn out, about as simple as you're procrastinating an assignment. And trust me, I've been there. You just don't want it. You just don't know how to start procrastinating studying for an exam because there's just so much information you just don't know where to start. Procrastination is usually anxiety-based. And so what we actually have to do is set you up in a way that that anxiety is not crippling to you. It's totally normal and natural to have anxiety. It's a, it's It's actually totally normal and it benefits us to have anxiety as a natural human response to the world around us, to our environments. But what is harmful to us is when we let it actually get in the way of things. So anxiety can help us to slow down and reevaluate what it is that we're doing, the choices that we're making, but we can't let it stop us. And I say this with the caveat of you have to make sure that the choices that you're making are the right choices because the anxiety may be telling you, stop, stop, this is the wrong choice. So you have to be reflective. You have to look inward. You have to have this mindset where you're willing to be reflective and look inward. And again, we help our clients do this all the time. We 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 teach our clients how to do this, our community members. It's really important that we understand that there's nothing wrong with you if you have anxiety about something. I've had anxiety about things too. It's completely natural and completely normal. But we have to remember that we can use anxiety to our advantage, okay? So if we're uncomfortable about something, if we have, if we feel anxious or antsy or nervous about something, then how can we use that to our advantage? We can use it to our advantage by figuring out the best way to actually get started by taking small steps. So often, and again, procrastination is about anxiety about the future. You have this like big thing that's coming up this big deadline, how are you ever going to get it done? Well, you 
have to break it into smaller pieces. So if it's studying for an exam, you might start by cracking the book or by listening to a lecture or reading your notes if it's not recorded or or referring back to the slides or rereading some of the readings and picking up on things that you didn't pick up on the first time. Looking for any sort of direction from your professor or instructor about what they were focusing on in that lecture or in that in the series of lectures if one followed from the the previous one. So I think it's really important that we contextualize procrastination and what it means because procrastination is a symptom of something else. And that's in my experience, myself and clients, it's anxiety about the unknown, anxiety about something that hasn't happened yet, and anxiety about something that maybe we have to do that we haven't done yet. And it's totally normal. We just have to figure out how to harness that energy to our benefit. All right. The next suggestion that I have for keeping on top of everything is that your environment matters. Where you're doing your work actually matters. Where you're studying, where you're reading, where you are thinking matters, right? If you are in a place where you're uncomfortable and you don't feel safe and you feel threatened and you feel like you can't think freely and your mind is in another place, you're not getting anything done. Okay, you're going to have to redo everything that you've just done all over again. But if you're in a place where you feel safe and comfortable and secure, whether that's home or the library or a coffee shop where nobody's maybe you live in a very busy place where and you just need some peace and quiet to get something done, then you can change your environment. So I think that the point about environment is really important because there were many times that that I studied at school in the library for like evenings and evenings and evenings and evenings and evenings. And I prepared for that because I knew that I wanted to study in the library. And it may not have even been, you know, as a result of anything, just that I wanted to be not distracted. Okay. Because at home, you know, there's you know, your laptop, your computer, your phone, everything is so close to you. There's the couch and there's the kitchen. And there's so many different ways to procrastinate that I just got rid of it all. And I said, okay, time to study in the library. And I would go up to the fifth floor, which was the highest floor. I think it still is of that specific library. And I would find a study carol that was at like the very back. So like no one, no, like none, like nobody could find me to socialize. And I would stay there till like eight, nine, 10 at night. And I would get done everything I needed to get done because I wanted home to be home. I wanted a break from the work. So I think that that is really important. And then once I got to grad school, I found that the library was actually too quiet for me. And see, my strategy changed because it didn't work for me anymore. So I changed it and I went to coffee shops, right? And then I ended up at this one coffee shop. I ended up at Starbucks actually. Now, and you'll hear this in another episode too, I think it may also have been in episode one or two, that the Starbucks that I actually did all of that work in is two doors away, or at least was, it's now something else, but it was two doors away from my current office now. So everything happens in really funny ways, but... The point is you need to find environments in which you can actually think and in which you can actually focus and where you feel free to write, take notes, think, prepare, and spend that energy once so that you don't have to do things over and over and over and over again. So environment matters. The next point that I have for you is sort of also a commentary on tech, on technology, on apps, on social media. I think also, like some of my other points, it's really easy to say, like, get off social media, turn it off, just turn your phone off, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is that I don't think it's that easy because, I mean, you pick up your phone to do one thing and you end up surfing for, you know, for however long. And then by the time you're, you realize what you're doing, it's like 20 minutes later and you realized you opened your phone to like check something else. So really number one, being mindful about your technology and how you're using it. And number two, to be mindful of which apps you're using. So for example, apps are, before I give you your, the examples, which I think will be obvious to everybody, but apps are designed to keep you there. Plain and simple, apps are designed to keep you there and 
they benefit by, and they make money. So it may be free for you to use the apps like TikTok, like Instagram. And even if there's a monthly fee for things like Netflix or Hulu or Crave or any other sort of streaming platform for shows and movies, the platforms benefit from your time on them. And they track the time that you spend on them. So you know, let's not think that you're spending time on the app and nobody knows about it. I mean, in order to download the app onto your phone and start using it or onto your computer or your TV or whatever, you agree to terms and conditions that actually tell you what they're going to do with data that they collect from you. And that includes time that you spend on the app and what it is that you're surfing. So the more time you spend, the more you're logged on, the more they actually can charge for advertising and the more they feed their algorithms for advertising. Do I have anything against advertising? No, in certain situations and other situations, I have some ethical qualms with some advertising and also some legal. But anyway, I think it's really important for you to just understand the platforms that you're using, understand that they are tracking your use and that they want to keep you on the apps as long as possible. Netflix is a perfect example and I have Netflix. So, you know, I'm not, you know, I I use it and it works for its purpose. But at the end of every episode, if you're watching a series, it says, you know, next episode starting in three, two, one. And you're like, oh, oh, I couldn't get the remote. Oh, I may as well just watch another episode. And by the time you know it, you've watched like seven episodes. And I think seven is when the notification pops up, like, are you still here? And you're like, oh God, I am still here. And they want to make sure that you're still there, right? They don't want your show to keep playing unless you're there. They would. So this is just something else that keeps you on the app. They And they're also tracking how many times you click, yes, I'm still here. Yes, I'm still here. Yes, I'm still here. So they know how long you're spending on the app, but you're not walking away or you're walking away and coming back. You're, the intent is to continue watching. Instagram tracks it too. Facebook tracks this too. TikTok tracks this too. Everything tracks the time you spend on the app. Some apps make it harder for you to log off than other apps, right? TikTok, you have to click twice to log, to to get out of the app, right? You click once just like you do every other app and it takes you back to the, the videos that are suggested for you. So these apps are designed to keep you there. Now, why am I explaining this? Why am I telling you this? Because you should know how you're being tracked. You should know how your data is being tracked. And I think that that will change the way you conceptualize your use of the platforms. The platforms are not giving you free access innocently. The app, the, the platforms are actually benefiting from your use. You're actually, and you're not using them for free. Let's remember, you are spending your time and energy there right? So this actually isn't free to you. This costs you your time, which you'll never get back. And this costs you your energy, which you also will not get back, right? It's really important to understand how tech works in order so that you can use it more effectively, okay? Next, and this is my last point for today, is that if you're checking out, take a break. Take a break. When you feel like dissociated from the work, you're not absorbing anything, do something productive to take a break. And we've talked about how to take breaks before here on the podcast. You can go for a quick walk. You can go get a coffee or a tea or a water. Go for a walk outside. Do something different. And some, in some cases, let's take it full circle back to your applications. You can actually work on your applications as a break from your schoolwork. And I actually really like this strategy because your applications become very enjoyable. It becomes a really enjoyable process, especially when you, when, and this is what I've heard from our community members and clients as well, is that when you work with us, you actually enjoy working on your applications. They do not feel like a chore. They don't feel like something you have to do, they are very much something that you want to do. So, and it's a very different way of thinking for schoolwork as compared with applications. And so that is a good strategy as well. But if that is not going to work for you on one day or several days, or that's not the kind of break that you need, what I would say is don't spend your break looking at screens, i.e. scrolling or watching shows. What I would say is go spend time with somebody who 
is supportive of you. Go and and go for that walk, listen to some music, listen to a podcast, and really help your brain think in a different way. The point of a break is to think in a different way than what it is that you're doing. So by taking a break, by going for a walk, by spending time with somebody, by talking to somebody, having a conversation, your brain is working differently, objectively. So so I think that that's also really important is if if you need a break, take a break. Don't rely on, on unhealthy vices and habits to keep yourself pinned to the desk. That's not healthy and it's not sustainable either. We've talked about that in in previous episodes as well. So if you need to take a break, take a break. And in fact, you should schedule in breaks and taking breaks actually helps you be more productive. So I'll go over all these points again. The first one was perceive your classes in a way that is constructive and productive to your success and the life that you're building, not destructive to that life. Make sure that the choices that you're making contribute to your success and don't deter from your success or take you further away from the success that you are aiming for, that you are building. Next is make contact with your professors. It's okay if they don't respond, but at least they'll see your name so that if you do need to contact them with a question or something throughout the semester, then they'll already be familiar with you. That's a great idea. Next, stay on top of your readings and coursework. Whether you do your readings before or after class, you have to figure out what works for you. And what worked for me was different in different classes in different years. So you've really got to figure that out for yourself. And don't focus on what other people are doing. Don't get caught in the trap of comparisonitis. Really focus on what it is that you are doing and do it well. And if it's not working for you, don't be afraid to change it. Procrastination. So really let's rethink procrastination and what it means. It typically arises from anxiety about something that hasn't happened yet. So think about and unpack what your procrastination is really about and then proceed with your next best step. Break your tasks down into smaller steps. What do you actually have to do? Start with working for five minutes. Start with working for 10 minutes and see how far you get. And if you feel good, keep going. If you need a break, take a break. Next, environment matters. You want to work somewhere where you feel like you can be productive and where you can think and where you can actually spend energy that is well spent. You don't want to have to redo things. So make sure that wherever you are, you're in an environment that is conducive to your thinking. Next, your tech. You have to be very aware of it and your use of it and how it uses you. So be very aware of of that, of your use of tech and the strategies that you can use to spend less time or only spend a limited amount of time on those platforms when you have other things to do, like setting timers. There's lots of strategies that you can use. There's There are other apps that can help you control the amount of time that you use. And so really take a hard look at how much time you're spending on those apps. Actually, if you go into the settings of your phone, for example, it'll tell you how much time or at least how much data or perhaps even Wi-Fi, how much, how much you're spending on those apps. So it's a pretty good indication of where you're spending your time. And lastly, if you're checking out or you need to take a break, take a break. Don't rely on unhealthy habits or vices. Schedule in your breaks. Schedule things into your schedule that you actually enjoy. For me, all through undergrad, all through grad school, all through law school, it was the gym. I scheduled in the gym at at, at set times and I didn't just go, sometimes I just went to the gym to, you know, do my own workouts and stuff. But more often than not, I went to classes that were actually at a scheduled time. And for me, that was wonderful because I made friends. It was a social time for me. And then I felt recharged in order to get back to whatever work I was doing. And that strategy still works for me to this day. I schedule in my, my time at the gym, whether it's in classes or in the gym where you do your own thing, that strategy still works for me. So make sure that that's scheduled into your calendar. It certainly is on mine. And schedule in other things that you enjoy. So have something to look forward to each week. It doesn't mean you need to spend a whole weekend doing something, but what it means is you can spend a couple hours here and there doing things that you actually enjoy. So 
Thank you so much for joining me on today's podcast. If you have any questions, please reach out. You can find me on Instagram at Apply Yourself Global. Please follow us there and DM me and let me know how you like this episode. And please leave me, leave the podcast review. Okay, thank you so much and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at applyyourselfglobal and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode, leave this episode a review, and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.